Well, good morning, Trinity Church. It's good to see you all. I invite you as you're able to please stand. Thank you for braving this uh, crazy road weather. <laughs> uh, you are the faithful remnant. All right. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you have given to us your servant's grace by the confession of a true faith to acknowledge the glory of the eternal trinity and in the power of your divine majesty to worship the unity. Keep us steadfast in this faith and worship and bring us at last to see you in your one and eternal glory, O Father, who with the Son and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns one God forever 
and ever. Amen. In celebration of the Spirit's outpouring upon the church, we raise our voices in praise as we sing. Happy Trinity Sunday, where we bind unto ourselves all kinds of things. I think I might leave out that doom part, though. I, I want to invite our children to please come forward for a godly play. All right, I hope you can hear each other over there. It's going to be right next to the road. Jesus took a little child in his arms and said to his disciples, whoever welcomes one such child in my name also welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes not only me, but the one who sent me. Almighty God, bless our children and their teachers with curiosity, creativity, and compassion as they enter into the mystery of your welcome and embrace. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. Enjoy Godly play, y'all. reading from the book of Genesis. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. And God said, let there be a dome in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. So God made the dome and separated the waters that were under the dome from the waters that were above the dome. And it was so. God called the dome sky, and there was evening, and there was morning, the second day. And God said, let the waters under the sky be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the earth put forth vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees bearing fruit of every kind on earth that bear fruit with the seed in it. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed of every kind, and trees of every kind bearing fruit with the seed in it. And God saw that it was good. 
and there was evening, and there was morning, the third day. And God said, Let there be lights in the dome of the sky to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years, and let them be lights in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth. And it was so. God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night, and the stars. God set them in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the fourth day. And God said, Let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the dome of the sky. So God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves of every kind, with which the waters swarm, and every winged bird of every kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them, saying, be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening, and there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures of every kind, cattle and creeping things and wild animals of the earth of every kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals of the earth of every kind, and the cattle of every kind, and everything that creeps upon the ground of every kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the wild animals of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the earth, sea, and over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. God said, See, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit, and you shall have them for food, and to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps upon the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw everything that he had made, and indeed, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all their multitude. And on the seventh day, God finished the work that he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. <coughs> so God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it, because on it God rested from all the work that he had done in creation. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Now we will read the eighth psalm responsibly. O Lord, our governor, how is your name in all the world? Out of the mouths of infants and children, your majesty is praised above the heavens. You have set up a stronghold against your adversaries. To call the enemy and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and stars you set in your courses. What is man that you should be mindful of him? The son of man, that you should seek him out. You have made him but little lower than the angels. You adorn him with 
glory and honor. You give him mastery over the works of your hands. You put all things under his feet. All sheep and oxen, even the wild beasts of the field, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, and whatever lost in the paths of the sea. O Lord, our governor, all things remain. A reading from the second letter of Paul to the Corinthians. Finally, brothers and sisters, farewell. Put things in order, listen to my appeal, agree with one another, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss, all the saints greet you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Gospel of our Savior Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory you, o the eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. This is the Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Christ. The other day, um, Manny and I were going to the store, and our little four-month-old miniature schnauzer, Sophie, looked up at us with these giant plaintive eyes like, please, Dad, don't go without me. And we just knew in that moment, ah, oh, we had to take her with us. Since it's Pride Month, I can tell you that as we drove to the store with this little dog in tow, I looked at him and I said, we cannot become those gays. <laughs> just, this can't be us. It turns out 
Those eyes are not an accident. They are not an accident. Puppy dog eyes, as they are known, are one of the many physical adaptations that mark domestic canines, Canis lupus familiaris, from the wild ancestors, the wolf, Canis lupus. Apparently, dogs developed exceptionally strong facial muscles to be able to pull their eyelids way up like that, giving them that characteristically adorable look. It works for them, and it works for us. It's a perfect example of evolutionary symbiosis. In recent years, for this very reason, evolutionary biologists and behavioral scientists have asked who domesticated whom. Did they domesticate us, or did we domesticate them? What's, what's going on here? And Sophie's manipulative behavior is a perfect case in point, isn't it? She knows exactly how to persuade us to get exactly what she wants, and Sophie often gets exactly what she wants. It turns out that's been happening for nearly 35,000 years, as wolves gathered around nomadic human encampments. It's been hypothesized that uh, because of fire, they were protected from large wild predators. Um, and actually, it's interesting, when we look at the record of early hominins in Europe in particular, uh, all other kinds of large pack, uh, pack hunting animals and carnivorous animals were obliterated by early humans. So saber-toothed tiger, we know that one, right? Um, the European hyena, they're all gone. So dogs remaining was kind of this evolutionary question, like, why are they still there? Um, and that, uh, that quest for understanding led to a number of uh, kind of possibilities, including this fire hypothesis. Um, they also ate the leftovers of the hunt, the discarded animal parts that are often a dead giveaway of temporary human settlements in those archaeological sites. So as certain wolves selectively interacted with humans and certain humans selectively sired ever more congenial wolves, hundreds of breeds of dogs were produced in the intervening time. Schnauzers have been around since about the medieval period, but miniature schnauzers, like my little Sophie, have only been around for about a hundred-ish years. And that's kind of remarkable to think about. This little creature who brings us so much joy, her type has only been around for about a hundred years. Now, you may be wondering why I've begun a sermon on Trinity Sunday about the history of dogs. <laughs> and it's not just because dog is God spelled backward, though that has something to do with it. <laughs> As we just heard in our reading from Genesis, humans are made in the image and likeness of God. Of God. And that suggests we are special in a strong sense. In a strong sense. This is important as a theological point, distinct from other creatures on the earth, endowed with the gifts of memory, reason, and skill, as our prayer book puts it. Yet we do not get our own day. Did you notice that? Humans were made on the same day as God bids the earth to bring forth everything that lives upon the earth, that is, all terrestrial creatures. We share kinship with the other creatures of the earth, an unbreakable bond. My mentor in theology, the Reverend Dr. Catherine Sandreger, uh, points this out, arguing that humankind occupies this uneasy middle ground, a kind of hybrid state that nevertheless orients us decisively toward God in the exercise of our creative faculties to make things, and especially the ability to construct elaborate linguistic systems. She argues that culture, language, and artifacts <clears throat> are all strong markers of our peculiar human identity. Similarly and conversely, she notes that we can only envy, and I love this, is very true, we can only envy our animal companions in their complete and effortless comfort as creatures at home in the good earth. And if you take a dog to the pond, you can see what that means on display, right? Uh, most of us prefer to skip that whole rolling around in the mud part. It just does not come naturally to us. And now, it's not that we are made in the image and likeness of God. The God in whose image we are made is the one who creates the world through speech. But as Professor Sondereger points out, the word image here is charged. Not only does it signify our royal privilege, those with authority to carry out the monarch's orders by virtue of the seal that they bear, Image also, already here in Genesis, chapter 1, 
anticipates the golden calf. Our tendency to employ the power of artifice for purposes other than to love one another, to serve creation, and to glorify God, what tradition and scripture call idolatry. We humans are indeed a remarkable lot. Uh, Kate once said, actually, in our systematic theology class, if you want to think about the difference between humans and all of the creatures on the earth, just think about the fact that you're never going to see a beaver making a nuclear bomb. And I said, but if you do, please be sure to report it to the authorities. <laughs> our little Sophie is clever enough that I think if she had opposing thumbs, she might try. <laughs> but, but all joking aside, Trinity Sunday, more than any other day in the church year, ought to be a time when we reflect on the immense gravity of this royal charge which we have been given to multiply, fill, and exercise dominion over the created order around us. We must be willing and able to administer the garden. And indeed, Sophie is a living, ever-present reminder to me of that royal office to which we have all been called. She wouldn't exist apart from our curatorial stewardship of the proverbial garden. Think about that for any of you who own dogs or cats. Cats fall into this category as well. If Genesis 1 is the story of God making humanity in the image of the one who speaks the world into being, cleaving subject from object, noun from adjective, and ordering all things by his mighty word, then Genesis 2 is the story of what that actually looks like. What does it look like for us to be made in that image? Adam's primary role in administering the garden is to name the creatures in it, including Eve. By this act of naming, he is doing more than simply establishing an early classification system of things in the garden. He is also asserting royal prerogative over them. To name is to know and to be able to call, and that implies a hierarchy of accountability with Adam at the top. But as we all know, the story doesn't really stop there, does it? Adam may be at the top, but his insatiable desire to become God's equal leads him down a pretty dark path. The whole story of the Bible can be summed up as humankind deciding to prioritize knowing above all things at any cost, sending the world into a tailspin that would throw the whole creation off kilter. But, this is a big but, as our Eucharistic prayer reminds us each week, God decides to come alongside these creatures, his fallen children, and to help guide them back to a better way. And when that doesn't work quite to plan, or perhaps as the final logic and fulfillment of that plan, he stages the ultimate intervention, appearing as the one whom Colossians describes as the image of the invisible God. I love that. Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God. Image bears menace, but it also bears promise, anticipating even our eventual redemption here already in Genesis 1. To be sure, our tendency towards artifice has never been stronger. I was thinking about the bishop's charge to us during my uh, installation. I truly wonder what God must be thinking of our foray into artificial intelligence. How fitting that we're getting there by training it to mimic what makes us most closely resemble our creator. As large language models like ChatGPT redefine the possibilities of predictive text, pushing it to the brink of human cognition, even with this one very rather narrow criterion, one wonders where this grand experiment is going to end. Now, I am not one who believes that it must perforce end in catastrophic failure. I am not an apocalyptist in my heart. The extinction of our species, for example. I think there is a lot of good that can come of it. Still, I do wonder what on earth we are doing by giving away the very thing that separates us from Sophie. Fundamental questions about what it means to be human are already being asked. This is important for us to consider as a church. These aren't questions that our children will have to ask. They are questions that we need to start asking now, today. It's not a world that is being built. It's a world that is already here. ChatGPT is reported to write subtle, inspiring poetry, for instance. And actually, I've read some. It's really quite good. Which begs the question, 
Is there anything more to poetry than words on a page? Can the human quest for just the right word in just the right place at just the right time to evoke a particular feeling, sentiment, or understanding be received or understood apart from or in addition to the artifact of that quest? Is there value in the journey or is it just where you arrive? That's a real question. Is there something about our creative process and humanity more broadly that cannot be captured by an algorithm? Are we so easily explained? Or is there within us some irreducible reality that no amount of machine learning can ever hope to imitate or approximate? These are big questions. These are big questions. And my greatest concern is that when I look out on the world, big tech companies are trying to answer some of those questions. They hire ethics professors and philosophy people to kind of think through these things. And Academies are asking these questions, philosophy departments, philosophy of mind, those kinds of questions are being raised. Uh, neurocognition, what constitutes neurocognition? But the church has a unique voice and something real for us to contribute. This notion of the Imago Dei, which is at the heart of our common life, is something that we ought to lift up as good news. We ought to lift up as good news and ought to help drive the conversation around possibilities and limits. In the Eucharist, we turn our attention to the very source of our present anxiety. Jesus, the Lord of glory and the living word, takes bread and wine. Think about that, bread and wine. Not grain and grapes, bread and wine. The ultimate artifacts of culture, at least culture in the first century Mediterranean world. The first century Mediterranean world lived off of bread and wine. God takes these artifices and gives it back to us as full reality, as true bed that does not perish, as new wine that never fails. Around this table, we are invited to remember and affirm what God has made is good indeed. It is very good. And we are called this week and always to accept our royal charge and renew our pledge to care for this good earth and all the creatures therein, even little Sophie. Amen. Let us pray for the church and for the world. Grant, almighty God, that all who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. Lord, in your mercy. Guide the people of this land and of all the nations in the ways of justice and peace, that we may honor one another and serve the common good. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation, that we may use its resources rightly in the service of others and to your honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. bless all whose lives are closely linked with ours and grant that we may serve Christ in them and love one another as he loves us. Lord, in your mercy. <clears throat> Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit, especially those who are named here Will and Luff, Hunter, Son, Anna Maria, Susan and Ted, Flavia and John, Ryan, Joanne, Stephanie and Luke, Robin, Lieutenant Carmelo, Helga, Dirk, Jim, Ron, Mark, Richard, and Aunt Pauline. Give them courage and hope in their troubles and bring them the joy of your salvation. Lord, in your mercy. Your we commend to your mercy all who have died, especially Reverend Ann Jensen, 
Jane Booker, Andy Kaufman, Esther Leong, Charlene May, Nadine Sadi, Richard O'Leary, Jacques Perron, and Janet Bryans. That your will for them may be fulfilled, and we pray that we may share with all your saints in your eternal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty God, by your Holy Spirit, you have made us one with your saints in heaven and on earth. Grant that in our earthly pilgrimage, we may always be supported by this fellowship of love and prayer and know ourselves to be surrounded by their witness to your power and mercy. We ask this for the sake of Jesus Christ, in whom all our intercessions are acceptable through the Spirit and who lives and reigns forever and ever. And now the peace of the risen Lord be always with you. Good to see you.
All right, as we continue to mingle and love on each other a little bit, um, we have one really great announcement about jail ministry first. Good morning. I'm Lori Hunter. I'm one of the members of the jail ministry team. We, uh, I just rotated off his head. Now it's Carol Park because we try to uh, refresh ourselves every six months or so. But I wanted to let you know, if you haven't seen already in the um, uh, email blast, that there is a, a training for jail ministry that will go on next Saturday morning, 9.30 to 11.30, at the Episcopal Church in Saratoga, St. Andrews. You may know that CIC Ministries is run by an Episcopal priest right from, she's the executive director, she's from St. Mark's in Palo Alto. So we, the Episcopalians are strong in this ministry. Um, what we do as a team and why you need to consider going in is that we go inside to the women's side of the jail and we have services twice a month on Sunday evenings. And we need more volunteers to help uh, go in. They, we uh, design a service that the women lead largely by themselves. We get feedback after every service. One of the things they love is the singing just saying, <laughs> you should consider it. <laughs> anyway, if you have any questions afterwards, please uh, reach out to me, okay? Thank you. The ministry, I got to um, just be present uh, one time this winter, and I just want to say, like, it was truly transformative for the women who were there. Um, it really made, I feel like their whole week, and you could just tell, like, uh, this is something that they are deeply connecting to and really nourishing them in such a difficult place. I think most of us just cannot imagine what it's actually like. So thank you. Thank you for your service and for sharing that with the wider community. Also, yes, huge shout out to our choir. This is our last week with them until the fall. So. <laughs> Valentino. <laughs> It's been a, I want to say, pretty demanding time <laughs> with the installation falling right on the heels of Easter. They've had a lot of work to do, and I've just been truly blown away every single week showing up and just bringing your full hearts, your full selves. Thank you so much for your ministry. It makes our lives, our worship so much more beautiful. Thank you. Um, what a great day. It is our uh, paternal feast day. It is the Feast of the Holy Trinity, and so after service outside in the courtyard, there will be a cake. Yeah, so come and have cake. What a great way to celebrate Trinity Sunday. Um, and let us walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us in offering and in sacrifice to God.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to God. It is right to offer God our praise and praise. It is truly right and a good and joyful thing to give you thanks, all holy God, source of life and fountain of mercy. For with you, our co-eternal Son and Holy Spirit, you are one God, one Lord, in trinity of persons and in unity of being. And we celebrate the one and equal glory of you, O Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, joining with angels and archangels, and with the faithful of every generation, we lift our voices with all creation as we sing. Blessed are you, gracious God, creator of the universe and giver of life. You formed us in your own image and called us to dwell in your infinite love. You gave the world into our care that we might be your faithful stewards and show forth your bountiful grace. But we fail to honor your image in one another and in ourselves. We would not see your goodness in the world around us. And so we violated your creation, abused one another, and rejected your love. Yet you never ceased to care for us and prepared the way of salvation for all people. Through Abraham and Sarah, you called us into covenant with you. You delivered us from slavery, sustained us in the wilderness, and raised up the prophets to renew your promise of salvation in every age. Then, in the fullness of time, you sent your eternal word, made mortal flesh in Jesus. Born into the human family and dwelling among us, he revealed your glory. Giving himself to death on the cross, he triumphed over evil, opening the way of freedom and of life. On the night before he died for us, our Savior Jesus Christ took bread. And when he'd given thanks to you, he broke it, giving it to his friends and saying, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Likewise, as supper was ending, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks to you, he gave it to them also, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is the cup of the new covenant, poured out in my blood for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink of it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Remembering his death and resurrection, we now present to you from your creation this bread and this wine. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be the body and the blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Grant that we who share these gifts will be filled with the Holy Spirit and live as Christ's body in this world. Bring us into the everlasting heritage of your daughters and sons that with all your saints, past, present, and yet to come, we may praise your name forever and ever. All this we ask through Christ and with Christ and in Christ and the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory are yours now and forever. Amen. And now let us pray in the language that our Savior gave us saying,
Alleluia. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us seek the peace. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. We take them in remembrance that Christ has died for us, and we feed on him in our hearts by faith with thanksgiving, knowing that it is the will of his own love that we should meet him here. If you feel called to receive from this table, let nothing stop you. Just a brief word about how we administer communion during this time of heightened caution. We continue to receive under one kind, bread alone. You simply come forward and extend your hands, and bread will be placed in your hand. If you wish to receive a blessing but not bread, you just cross your hands over your chest like this. We also have a gluten-free option for any who may need it.
us pray. O God, the Creator, O Christ, the Incarnate Word, O Holy Spirit, the Giver of Life, O Blessed Trinity of Love, you have fed us with your grace in this foretaste of your heavenly banquet. We commit to walk in the way of Jesus. Send us forth, bearing your justice and mercy, to transform the world with your love in our hearts, your truth in our minds, your strength in our wills, until at the end of our journey, we know the joy of our homecoming and the welcome of your embrace in Jesus Christ, our Savior. The Spirit of God fill you with all power and blessing. The Spirit of God unite the church in love and gather us together in her harvest of justice. The Spirit of God bring us to that table which she spreads in the presence of Christ and feast forever with all the saints in light. Let us go forth into the world to love and to serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Spirit. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Happy Trinity Sunday.